applause. <laughs> Top on the bottom. Was it paid? B bottom left. So, I am Craig the Sign Guy. I did uh, pass out a sign-up sheet. If anybody uh, is not on the list and uh, wants to get it, I suspect that a lot of you already are. Uh, I'm now on sign 190. Um, and it was interesting, I had uh, two people respond. One was from some liberal that wanted off the list. He says, take me off your list. And I tried it, and he, he wasn't in my email system, and it looked like he was like three levels deeper than uh, that, you know, from forwards. And another one that wanted to be on the list. So I think the list is going maybe three or four levels deep. So, you know, I don't know how many thousands of people this, this goes to. Um, but it does go to 15 different countries where I have uh, friends uh, around the world from uh, working in business. And I have a message that I received today from the United Kingdom from my friend Bob Nixon. And he says, Craig, King George and I will be able, unable to attend due to domestic problems in England. Regard, Bob. So it does, uh, does get around. Um, I asked Jake and Jack uh, to be able to talk about freedom and what's happened to freedom. Uh, you know, over over the last hundred years. Where did I get my your computer? Um, yeah, just leave it there for a second. So freedom has been under assault for over over a hundred years, and you can go back to the antitrust laws of the 1890s, the Sherman Act. Federal Reserve was created in 1913. Prohibition in the 20s and 30s, and all the mob violence that came with, uh, with Prohibition. FDR's New Deal in 1933, you know, it's all about social programs. And FDR had New Deal number two improved, which gave power to the union, social security, and minimum wage. And I see minimum wage is still being talked about today. And protests in New York City, and McDonald's workers want $15 an hour. The LBJ, Great Society, the War on Poverty, War on Drugs. Uh, the Republicans had their bit. Remember Bush saying, we need to abandon the free market to save the free market? Oh. And President Obama, you didn't build that. Fair, she fair share, fair deal, fair shake, social justice, Obamacare, and now he's talking the last couple days about inequality in income. All of these ideas have, at its core, you have to give up a little freedom for the greater good. And that individuals have to sacrifice to the majority. So this title, Freedom is Individual, is Indivisible, is actually from a speech that Maggie Thatcher gave that until about four weeks ago I wasn't aware of. And it really inspired me to put this together and to asked for this time on the agenda. And that speech that Maggie Thatcher gave was in 1975, and it was the dedication of Free Enterprise Day. And I want to read an excerpt out of her speech. What she said is Free Enterprise Day is dedicated to the destruction of one of the most dangerous of modern myths. There is an increasing belief that freedom is divisible that you can have political freedom and economic slavery, that you can pr preserve intellectual freedom and destroy commercial independence, that you can fight for freedom of speech yet overthrow freedom of enterprise. No myth is more dangerous. Freedom is indivisible. Once the state controls the means of production, distribution, and exchange, all of us will become dependent upon us. The whole nation becomes dependent upon the decision of the bureaucracy and of the politicians. And it is obviously so. 
If the state is the only source of capital, then only those ideas, those people, and those aims which are approved by the state can get money for development. If the state is the only source of patronage, then only those causes, those ideals, those charities which commend themselves to the state can raise money that they need. And she goes on about employment and housing, and uh, but she says this. But they say, you are putting forward an extreme choice. You are talking about total state takeover. That could not happen here. Couldn't it? It's not the real, is it not the real fact that this government is taking the country faster towards the centralized state than any previous government? Month by month, day by day, the freedom of free enterprise is curtailed and the power of state enhanced. So that was the great Maggie Thatcher in 1975. You know, the first time I saw uh, Maggie Thatcher, you know, maybe I saw her before, but I never really paid attention to her. But when I was living in Antwerp, Belgium, uh, we had two channels, BBC One and BBC Two. And there was a picture of Maggie Thatcher visiting a university, visiting a chemistry class. And she walks up to the blackboard and she starts teaching chemistry, starts writing chemical equations on a blackboard. <coughs> Uh, and you know that was her background. She was, she was a scientist by uh, by training, and I think you know in kind of her views that scientific background is really evidence in a lot of a lot of her views. So in this speech, I divide uh, individual, uh, divided freedom into four different parts. So individual freedom, political freedom, economic freedom, and real money. So let me explain each of, each of these parts. So individual freedom is really related to what it means to be a human. That we survive differently than animals. We survive by reason. So we need to think, to act, to produce, to defend ourselves and our family and pursue long-term well-being and happiness. So all of these things are natural rights. They are pre-political. They were not given to us by our government. And the core of this, really, is your life belongs to you. Um, it doesn't belong to a king. It doesn't belong to society, to a government, to your neighbors. And neither the poor nor the United Nations have any kind of claim over your life. So you are free to live your life. That's really the essence of economic freedom. Now the difficulty is everybody else has that same right. And that's what really gives the rise to political freedom. So the link between individual freedom and political freedom is really individual rights. That's what links the, links the two. What a right is, it really is about action. It reserves man's freedom of action in a social, social setting. And you don't have to ask for permission. It's your right. It's your natural right. Oops. I got it. I think there's like a delay in it. Um, so a, night, a right never imposes an obligation on another. If it does, it's not a right. Um, only, and the only obligation, really, is don't initiate physical force on others. So we formed our government and gave them the exclusive use of force to protect our individual rights. So the use of force against force. And the essence of this is really freedom of action. So the need for economic freedom, the third part of this, it's really the desire to better our lives. And it's like specialization. So you're a shoemaker and you make 10,000 pairs of shoes and your family can only use four is you have a need to trade with other people. So in a proper society, all economic decisions are individual. So what you invent, what you produce, where your factories are, um, who you hire, what terms you hire on, who your customers are, what your distribution is, what your price is, are all individual decisions. 
And in a real free society, there would be a complete separation of economics and government, just like there's a separation of religion and government. And capitalism is the only moral social system um, to live under. And there's really two aspects of, of capitalism. Capitalism protects individual rights, and under capitalism, all property is privately owned. It's not owned by the government, it's owned by individuals, and it's your right to trade or not. So under economic freedom, you know, the essence of it is really this, this right to trade. The, uh, the third, or the fourth part I put on this is real money. So, you know, money's really part of economic freedom, but I spelled this out separately just because of its importance and because it's been hijacked by the state through fiat, uh, fiat currency and through deficit spending. So real money is simply your productivity of labor and thinking frozen to consume it later. For you to save it, to invest it, or to trade it with others. That's what real money is. And in the history of the world, you know, gold and silver uh, have, you know, they had many proponents like Dan back here in all these different countries, and it evolved as objective money in different times in history and different countries of, of the world. And real money is moral and good because it's created by your virtues. You produced it, you earned it, and you have the right to keep it. Real money is required for your intellectual freedom and to bring, bring us full circle back um, to individual freedom. And the essence really is be free to earn and free to save. So in summary, all four stand together. An assault on one is an assault on all. And I think Ayn Rand said it best when she said, intellectual freedom cannot exist without political freedom. Political freedom cannot exist without economic freedom. A free mind and a free market are corollaries. She also said reason and freedom are corollaries. When men are rational, freedom wins. When men are free, reason wins. Or in the words of what Maggie Thatcher was saying in that speech, is freedom is indivisible. So in the intro I said, freedom has been under assault for over a hundred years. Statists of all variety, be they socialists, communists, or fascists, push that freedom must be controlled for the benefit of the greater good. It, it's really the most evil concept ever. Most of us accept this greater good morality, either explicitly like the left, so just listen to President Obama or our Keith Ellison and you know a lot from the left, or implicitly, implicitly from the right. So let me make this really explicit in really an earthy term about what happens when you mix freedom and force. So Jack may find me twenty dollars for, for saying this. We'll see. <laughs> mixing freedom and force is like mixing horse shit and ice cream. It doesn't do much to the horse shit, but it sure ruins the ice cream. <laughs> and the real question about freedom is how much horse shit and how much force do you want in your freedom? <laughs> so actually that expression, uh, some of the three emers will recognize where that's from. It's from a guy by the name of Les Williams. He's a Texan. He's a true American. He was a firefighter trained by Red Adair. And he put out the world's largest petroleum fires ever on the face of the earth. And he's a very heroic guy. And I heard him use that expression in front of about 200 Brits. <laughs> Where was the fire? Uh, they've been all over, all over the world. Yeah. Gigantic uh, oil, oil fires, tank fires, uh, you know, over a 20-year period of time. John Wayne played that character in a movie? Yeah, so John Wayne was uh, playing the Red Adair character in that movie. 
So let me go through what happens when freedom is, is divided. So when freedom is divided, um, in this individual freedom area, free to live becomes your life belongs to the state. So rights are redefined from the right to be free to earn a living to the rights, to the goods. Just like Santa Claus here, giving out food stamps and cash for clunkers and, uh, and bailouts. And the concept of rights go from negative rights to positive rights. And the obligation is laid on us to pay for that. And the role of the state becomes redistribution. And if you don't believe this, listen to Obama or Keith Ellison or Dayton or you know any Maxine Waters, Elizabeth, what's her name? Warren? Is it Warren? Elizabeth Warren? Yeah. Any of those on the left. I mean, it's explicit. It's blatant. I once, uh, about two years ago, I went to a debate at the University of Minnesota between Dane Smith, who is the president of Growth and Justice in the Twin Cities, which is like a redistribution of wealth progressive organization, and your own Brook from the Ayn Rand Institute. And after about 45 minutes into that debate, your own Brook got Dane to agree, yes, part of your life must belong to the state. And then the debate went on, well, what part, what percent? And the Aaron Brook never did pin him down. But it's where the left is coming from, is, is part of your life belongs to the state. So if you divide freedom and politics, this uh, free to act becomes, well, you only get to act by permission. So what you eat, what you drink, what you smoke, your freedom of speech, what guns you own, how and if you can use your property, how and if you can start a business, what health care you have, how big your signs can be, which is a major impact on me, are all impacted and you're no longer free to act and it's only action by permission. The next area, this free to trade really becomes this concept that the government will manage the economy. The government knows how to manage the economy better than the free market. You're doing a great job. Yeah, great, yeah. Uh, the government will protect you and all the downside risks from, from capitalism. The govern knows, government knows best in, in picking winners and losers. The belief that the government can manage the economy to only get the benefits of capitalism and none of the risks were pursued by three individuals at the same time, in the same time frame. So Adolf Hitler, Mussolini, and FDR all pursued the same concept. They called it the third way. We now more politely call it the mixed economy. And as a matter of fact, Adolf Hitler wrote a letter to FDR about the New Deal and about how he thinks he's got the right approach to managing the economy. So Hitler's view was different than the communist view. The communists thought they had to own production. Hitler's view was, well, if you control taxes and regulation, you don't have to own production, we'll just, we'll just control it. So the last area, if you divide freedom and try to control money, so free to earn and save becomes, and you've heard this a lot over the last five years, pay your fair share. This was driven by a theory of social justice by a philosopher by the name of John Rawls in 1971. And it's the very core and essence of the philosophy behind Barack Obama. 1971 was also the year Nixon, remember a Republican, abandoned the gold standard. And fiat money was unleashed upon America and upon the world. On the evil of fiat currency, Alan Greenspan wrote in 1966 an article entitled Gold and Economic Freedom. And this was published in Ayn Rand's book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Greenspan said, fiat money and deficit spending is simply a scheme for the hidden confiscation of wealth and only gold stands in the way of this insidious process. 
So what he's talking about is you don't need to get approval for taxation, is you just print more money, you inflate the money supply, and you steal everybody's wealth and savings. Um, just today in the American Thinker, there's an article entitled, Obama's Plan to Snatch Your Savings. Read it, it's very enlightening. And uh, what it was is about a 2010 push to take over retirement plans and reduce risk by rolling over to treasury bonds. Now they have a new concept called the automatic IRA. So watch for our governments to try to get into our 401k plan. So this is really freedom destroyed. So the accelerator really is fiat money and deficit spending. I once made a sign that said, the Federal Reserve and the treasurers, the Treasury Department, are like two drunks leaning on each other so they don't fall over. <laughs> and that really is true. And if you really want to understand how evil this was and how crooked it was when the Federal Reserve uh, was formed in 1913, read The Creature from Jekyll Island by, by Griffin. It's really, really an excellent book. The good news, and Jake mentioned this, Santa Claus, is that 2013 deficit was only $680 billion. The four previous years were 1.4, 1.3, 1.3, 1.1 trillion dollars. So over five years, six trillion dollars were spent over and above revenues taken in. Um, and if you take a look at what that is versus profitability of the Fortune 500, total profit was 824 billion. They spent seven years of all the wealth of the, or all the profit of the Fortune um, 500 companies over the last five years. So deficit spending enables tremendous political power, and that political power is used for two things. One is for crony capitalism, and there's all sorts of forms, and I know that uh, our speakers afterwards will talk about this, but it can be you know, green energy and Solyndra, it can be you know, our agricultural subsidies, it can be you know, corporation involvement like the GM deal, uh, bank bailout, unions get involved, cities, state programs, and all the pork barrels bundled into Obamacare. The other area is redistribution of wealth. So this is really expansion of the entitlement programs and food stamps. And if you took, take a look at the essence of Obamacare, Obamacare is about redistribution of wealth. So the goal of political power is to buy votes and to buy elections. You know, it looks like the whole system is crooked, but it was legally established. And uh, it's a term that Bastier called legal, legal plunder in his book, The Law, that was published in the 1850s. So if you take, let me return back to uh, Maggie Thatcher. If you take a look at Maggie Thatcher and what she accomplished over her uh, career as prime minister, here's what she faced in the United Kingdom. No growth, unemployment at 12%, in the UK, 20% in Wales and in Ireland, an oil crisis of 1974 and in, or 73 and 74, inflation, major industries that were nationalized, so coal, steel, energy, railroads, airlines, telecom, and really powerful unions and strikes throughout the United Kingdom. Yet one lady, an iron lady, changed a nation with an alliance with Ronald Reagan began to change the world. So one person can have an impact and they both understood the impact that free markets and free minds could liberate a world and that freedom was indivisible. So let me just show you out of uh, the world of Craig the Sign Guy and how the Tea Party principles fit. Can you click it one more time? One more. 
I uh, go through this to the next slide. Yeah, so these are the three Tea Party principles. Once more. So constitutionally limited government, free markets, one more, and fiscal responsibility. So it is all about freedom, and it's all you know perfectly aligned, and that's why I fully support the Tea Party, and have been doing everything I can to uh, to help reverse the course of, of where we are. And we can all do a lot. Um, you know, we can use our individual strengths to really make a difference and to make an impact. Well, thank you very much.